Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone today. Welcome, welcome. This is the National Health Education Standards Town Hall, and we are just absolutely um, delighted to have you here today. So uh, welcome again, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. Great, I see some introductions in the chat. Yes, go right ahead and introduce yourself. So, so we are the National Health Education Standards Task Force and you may, may be wondering what is a task force? Maybe you've heard of it or never really thought about it before, but a task force is a temporary grouping of people who come together to accomplish a specific task. And uh, so although we have a, a lot of uh, moving parts, to our assignment, our actual task um, to stay focused on is to revise the National Health edu Education Standards. So we're gonna take a look, a little bit look at the um, people and the process today. And then the majority of the time we do want to hear from you. So um, take it away, Nadine. All right, we are very excited, as Sarah mentioned, to be here today and just share the latest of what we've been up to. So our task force members, just so you have a sense of who we are, we're convened from ocean to ocean for the purpose of revising national health education standards, and we bring our diverse lenses, our experiences, our expertise to this process. So uh, we come from a variety of backgrounds, including supporting a variety of community settings, rural, suburban, urban. We bring a range of years of health-related experience into the field. We've taught and served from elementary, um, early childhood, middle school, high school, higher ed, and community settings, and we have a range of expertise across standards and topics. This is who is on our task force, and um, if they can just wave in the camera or say hi in the chat, I think it'd be nice for everyone to see. Um, many of us are here today, and we'll be leading you through today's um, sharing of what we've been up to, where we're going, where we've been, as well as um, some time for Q&A. Well, hi everyone, welcome. This is Mary Conley. And uh, on this slide on the left, you'll see a picture of the first edition of the National Health Education Standards. I was a member of the committee long, long time ago that revised that book into the one that you see in the middle. Um, and now uh, looking forward to what our new book will be like. But in, in those particular days, um, we met by telephone and we met twice in person, but it was all done by telephone and in subcommittees. We still are doing subcommittees now, but the whole idea of working through the phone was the only technology we had at the time and it worked. We produced a beautiful book. Um, I discovered this book, the, the first edition, on my, work, on my shelf in my classroom one day when I was cleaning and decided to give it a try. And uh, at, before then, I was trained to teach content. I tried teaching skills, and it made a world of difference in my instruction. So I'm sold on skills. I've been for a long time. And um, you're going to be very happy with the skills you see in the new, in the new edition. Next. So here we have the eight standards. In the original book, there were seven. And one of the standards contained decision making and goal setting in the same standard. So one of the big changes in that original book was breaking out that one standard into two, the ones that we have now, a special standalone standard for decision making and one for goal setting. And, and it's remaining that way for the new edition. So I hope you enjoy them. They're beautiful. You're going to love them. Thank you. All right, next slide, and then I think we're hearing from Lori. All right, so um, I'm Lori Beckhofer from Michigan Department of Education, and excited to be part of this group and this um, process. And um, as I just am pulling up my notes here, just one second. Um, so we have been married together, this group of people. We have spent a lot of time together. We have been together literally almost every other week. For uh, for almost two years, 
So we spent a lot of time and done a lot of great work together. And for those of you who've been part of any group, you know how important it is at the beginning to really get to know the folks that you're working with, to, to think about all of the different skills and knowledge and experience that you bring to the table, but to really build those trusting relationships with one another so that you can have those difficult conversations and um, challenge each other um, as you're moving forward. So we, as with any group, did that team building work at the beginning of our process and continued it throughout the time together. Um, so that we would have those collaborative norms for working together and getting things done. Um, that started in September of 2021. And then from October to December of 2021, we really started looking at visioning and that big picture in terms of where we were going. And so we looked at an other national health initiatives that were going on. We looked at various theories of behavior change. Um, and I got my master's in public health many, many years ago. And so some of the theories of behavior change that were around 10, 20, 30 years ago have changed a little bit. And so we have more theories of behavior change to look at. And those are so, so important because we want to help young people to develop the knowledge and skills so that they can go on to lead healthy lives. And so we took a look at those. Um, we started big picture in terms of thinking about what does a healthy person look like and what is that vision and that health is not just the absence of, of disease, but health is something beyond that in terms of what we're striving for and, and that, that influenced where we went um, in terms of the, the revision of the standards. Um, then from January to April of 2022, we started a detailed explorations of the standards themselves. And so we started with a, we, we did a SWOT analysis, and probably many of you have engaged in a SWOT analysis, where you look at something that exists, and you look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it's really helpful in terms of that, because it really gives you that context to think about what are the things that are strong that we don't necessarily need to change? What are the things that we want to take a look at um, improving? Um, we, we talked a lot about issues in terms of, um, trying to look at issues around health and social injustices and making sure that um, not too much uh, responsibility is put on the individuals, on students themselves, because they exist within a broader context of family and community. And so trying to look at that kind of collective responsibility. And that's one of the lenses that I think you'll see that's a little different in this new iteration. Um, also kind of language that's more deficit-based, trying to move that in a different direction. So the SWOT was really helpful. Um, and we, in the meantime, got feedback because feedback is such an important value to us in this process. So we, very early on, we got feedback um, from a town hall and also um, in, two, in the previous year at the convention, we got feedback from folks and also a ton of feedback from the field in terms of what they felt like needed to change from the second edition of the health education standards. Then meanwhile, of course, health education is just one subject area within many subject areas. So we looked at standards from other content areas, from ELA and math, science, social studies, to look at what are some common things in those other content areas that we wanted to look at as we revise the standards. And then there's some great work that's happening in states. And some states have moved things along a lot since the second edition. And so we wanted to look at different state standards to see what were some of the good things that folks had in their various states. In the meantime, we met with the national, the PE standards revision because there's um, a wonderful opportunity for cross-pollination between what's happening in the physical education standards revision process and ours to see where there were um, areas for um, collaboration and potential points of synergy. Then from April to June of 2022, I feel like just like a huge history here, um, we started to get into more subcommittee groups. And so we did something, if you wanna to move to the next slide, where we looked at both, um, we divided into two groups, to, or we did horizontal groupings first, and then we did vertical groupings. And so in horizontal groupings, within our within the subcommittee, I mean, within the task force, we have folks who are really more expert on high school standards, middle school and elementary. And so we broke into those groups and really looked at the standards for that grade grouping and what those needed to look like. And then um, we moved into um, vertical groups. And so this is across K-12. And then looked at, um, we had groups 
for standards one and two, three and four, five and six, and seven and eight. And so it's a very iterative process. And for people who like things neat and clean and cut and dry, it wasn't always that way because you're constantly kind of recircling and like connecting with other groups to make sure that what you're working on is aligned with and in tandem with what they're working on because you don't want to go in completely different directions. And so it's this combination of going into depth in your subcommittee group and then coming back to a large group to make sure that we're all on the same page as we advance things forward. Anything I'm missing, folks? That was beautiful, Lori. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. Tilsa Gonzalez here, proud to be task force member out of New Rochelle. Um, thank you, Lori. So as Lori explained to you, um, we came up with a draft and then we started to review our work. And so internally within the Shape America organization, there are several committees. Three of the committees that have already reviewed the draft of the standard before the external review has been the National Physical Education Standards Task Force, the Health Education Council, and the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. And so internally, they took a look at the draft, provided feedback, and then once that feedback was um, reviewed, now we are in our current phase where at recently at the Shape America National Convention, there was a presentation and at the end of this presentation, you'll see that there's a QR link as well as the ability for people to provide feedback on this draft of the standards. There's a public survey that's being surfaced. And of course, right now we're in the process of hosting this town hall. So it has been important for us to make our rounds to receive feedback that will impact the final release of the standards that we set in place. And uh, Tilsa, we also had the wonderful um, opportunity to have the June summer retreat. Hi, this is Angela Beal Talfiq from Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. Hello. And it's an honor to be here. I'm sorry, you know, as you can imagine, balancing between uh, classes and, and more. But um, just to, to back up, that's what we do on this team. Um, in terms of looking um, through the documents also, in May and June, we also did in our summer retreat, we had that internal review and feedback. Um, and and that was prior to so uh, that it also allowed us to prepare for the spring feedback, which we did do at convention also with the great coffee talks and updated sessions and and public survey. And we have a lot of information that we now really have to be reflective on. Next slide, please. So I know, so so we're excited, guys, to talk about uh, this. As you see, I am the one mother of four guys. Uh, the great thing is, as teacher educators, we're very flexible. So we're excited to share um, that right now with um, some of our standards and rational sta statements, we're really looking at uh, performance indicators. And, and this draft now is a culmination of the feedback that we are glad to say that we had actually have gained um, as a result of, of the conference. And so there, you guys, uh, if you had the opportunity, there are countless hours in review um, that have gone on in the teams, especially also as we are breaking into our additional subgroups. And we're excited really to hear from the larger community because um, that's really truly informing our practice. And, and we want the, these standards to truly be reflective of all of the social change that we have all engaged in and been experiencing together. And we should expect that um, the feedback that we're gathering from convention and coffee talks um, really is updated uh, to meet really what we want Shape America National Standards to be. Uh, and this comes from you um, for being in Seattle. I was glad I didn't hit the get stuck in those storms, but thank you guys. <laughs> but um, that, please also remember the public survey is still really open and we want you to share your feedback and it'll be open through May 2nd. And we know that you all are experiencing many different things all across the country. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about being on this committee 
is the honesty that we have been able to have. We've been able to engage in some, um, I would say some courageous conversations. And, and that is something that uh, is really important, especially when we're supporting the diverse classrooms and the students and understanding uh, the, the valuing uh, that health can serve, right, in this space. So um, thank you and make sure you guys go on and, and log on and continue sharing that feedback. Thank you. I do want to just pause before Sarah or Nadine covers this next slide and say that I did put a direct link to the um, issue, which has the current draft ready for review. Thank you so much, Audra. So we have touched on a little bit of these points. I actually may not have said my name at the beginning. So I'm Sarah Toth. And uh, so we've touched on these in each of the slides, but this just gives you a little bit of a roadmap so um, you can you can see where we are and where we've been. Of course, we've spent some time building community, creating some shared vision, um, several drafts actually, but this is the official draft that we're working from right now uh, and standard statements, uh, performance indicators. And so right now we have a draft document um, that is, out for feedback. And Nadine, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so it's been a really exciting process, as you can probably tell from all of the sharing from our many task force members. We're, we're really excited about this point in the process now because we're, in, we're gathering that collective feedback that'll help to inform the next steps of our revision process as we work toward the release of the third edition of National Health Ed Standards in spring 2024. Um, some of the feedback that you share is really going to help us with our next steps in refining the standards, the rationale statements, the performance indicators. Uh, we're working on the manuscript for the published book and the rollout of the initial support materials of resources and professional development so that we can have a successful launch of the field. So we're really excited. Um, anything else you want to add, Sarah? And then we'll pass it along to Holly. I think um, I just want to point out too, we've had a lot of great suggestions as far as like having a glossary. We are going to incorporate a glossary. Um, we're going to update the accompanying manuscript. So that's all in the works as well. But um, good job covering that, Nadine. Thank you. Next slide. Hi, everyone. Holly Elbrin here. And here's what you've all been waiting for. And what we've been waiting for is to hear from all of you. And so we wanted to open this up. Audra is going to help us out with kind of navigating between Audra and Nadine, I believe, navigating the um, raising of hands and calling on people and answering questions. But to get us thinking, as Audra said, she had posted a link to the document if you need to refresh your memory in the chat box there. But to think and to provide some feedback, what is it that you like about this current draft that you're seeing? Maybe what are some considerations for improving the draft? And anything that's jumping out at you that's a red flag that the task force should consider. So we'll go ahead and just feel free to use the icons to raise your hands. I will also say um, that we have about a you know, half hour or so for this conversation. And so we're going to really try to get as many voices heard on this conversation as possible. So feel free, raise your hand in your right. reaction. I see uh, Joseph Gorman has a hand raised. Joseph, if you come off mute and you can come off camera if you'd like to answer your question or ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Holly, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Good to see you, Joe. Uh, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Connecticut cadre of health education trainers. So we've actually been trying to train various districts on school uh, health education that is skills-based. One of the things that I've noticed in doing it, we're trying to break people out of this mold of being heavy on content and less on skills. The listing of the standards themselves, when I explain them in trainings, I say to them, okay, this is standard one, now put it over here and forget about it while we talk about what we really need to do here. And then come back and say, okay, now the functional information, the content we bring to the other seven. 
My suggestion for improvement of this is take standard one, drop it down to standard eight and move everything else up one so that you can go through the first seven and then you can rewrite eight as the, use this to access information, to assist in making decisions, you know, to um, advocate for whatever. I think it will just make life a lot easier to break people out of that mold of saying, okay, we're gonna fit these other seven into what I've traditionally done, which is to pound out content. So that's my suggestion. I would drop it down because people have a way of equating numeration with importance. Great, thank you. Kim. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Kim. I'm from Columbia, Missouri, uh, health and PE coordinator. Um, I just wanted to say I really do like the focus on skills um, for districts like mine that are moving to a standards referenced um, SRG look at assessment and curriculum writing. Um, it, it's really helped us create a bigger body of evidence as we write those um, where it used to traditionally be based on content. Um, and so I do agree um, with what was just said. It'd be handy to have that at the bottom so we can really focus those skills right off the bat. Um, but it's really helped our work in the SRG space. And I know a lot of districts are moving to that. Um, we were really limited with a body of evidence if we just focused on the content. And so this has really given our teachers an aha moment of, oh, we do teach those skills. Those are our priority, what we need to. And so that's in every content unit. So thank you um, from this SRG district as we navigate that. And then um, I'm reading in the comments, Mari, um, I kind of echo that comment about the word valid. Um, that's a lot of our teaching on what is a good resource. And so what is some of the information that kids are gathering. We want to make sure that that is still um, medically appropriate, um, medically accurate. And so I think the word valid um, or reliable, um, I think there still needs to be some type of adjective to describe that type of um, health information that kids are consuming. And so I kind of echo that. So a plus one there and Joseph, a plus one um, to your comment. But I, I like the overall look of the skill focus. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Kim and Mary. Thank you for that comment about adding in valid there. I also want the secondary comment, um, seeing significant use of the term various throughout the performance indicators. And the use seems to suggest a degree of randomness as opposed to diversity. Language is very important. So if anyone else has anything to add related to those comments, or Mary, if you have anything to add related to that, feel free to chime on in here. Um, yeah, sure. So I know we're, um culturally and especially in our content area focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so when I was looking at the performance indicators, there seemed to be a lot of um, identify various, um, I'm pulling off the top of my head now, it's 3 a.m. here, so forgive me, but a lot of various, select or identify various ways to do this, various ways to do that, various, identify various such and such. And it came, it, it really started to become, well, as long as they can Identify, students can identify or, or describe something, anything. And so it became a sense, to me, it became a sense of randomness as opposed to diversity. Diversity is a little bit more specific in a sense of, are you crossing different thresholds in different communities and different um, genres of whatever, you're, of whatever you're looking at versus just, can you just name anything? And that's what various seem to indicate. And that was a concern for me. Well, thank you for that. And one of the, the thoughts, and so I'd be interested to have more people chime into this. I'm seeing some things starting to pop up in the chat. Um, is one of the rationales for changing it to say various and to open it up as opposed to listing specific influences was to get at that point to allow people uh, not to pigeonhole people into certain influences, but hearing from these comments, I'd be interested in folks' thoughts about, do, is it too open or is there more direction needed? Um, so as you're pondering that, Allison's comment 
also taking into design when designing curriculum, the diversity of different school districts and the health curriculum applying to different ethnic backgrounds, um, a variety of cultural, racial, ethnic considerations. Judy had noted her feedback. Uh, I'm trying to see here, Judy. Um, that it's well done, uh, inclusive, thoughtful, and offers teachers the opportunity to transition to inquiry-based instruction rather than focus on specific units and content. Um, skills are timeless. Also, health ed doesn't look the same across the country, and this document speaks to students. What others? Feel free to raise your hand, chime in, come off mute. Various, feeling various might be too vague. Uh, hi, this is Katie Shantry. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I apologize. From from Michigan. Um, so kind of on the topic of various or um, variety. So I was specifically had circled under strand, standard four um, grades three through five about demonstrate refusal skills to use in a variety of situations. And I know like these are national standards and every like State might create their own health standards as it aligns to national standards, but sometimes including that inclusivity, but variety of skills as it turns to refusal in terms of health, like feel like maybe it's maybe too broad when especially at that lower grade span. As we get older, I feel like personally the word various variety might be a little more well used, but I feel like at the lower levels, it's helpful to be maybe a little more direct for our teachers to know for performance indicators. Great, thanks, Katie. Anyone have thoughts about what could be put in place of that instead? Without, I should say, without the caveat of you know listing out thirty-two different influences, right? <laughs> Trying to find the balance between those two things. And if as you're thinking on that, someone had another thought on a, even on a different tangential topic, feel free to chime on in. Oh, oh, oh now I'm seeing stuff pop up here. Alrighty. Um, within individual, interpersonal, community, and society contexts, um, such as or not limited to, that there's a change in language about enhancing health and the standards. Why is there a lack of consistency between support health and well-being versus promote health and well-being? So that's one question. Let's let's dive into that one a little bit. Um, we would be interested in folks' thoughts that one of the things that is still being fleshed out is the use of support versus promote. Do folks on this call have any thoughts related to that? Are all the standards, are they about promoting? Should the word be supporting? Should it be promoting? What do you all think? Oh, Holly, you're, you're mute. <laughs> yeah, it's got that. Thank you. Um, I saw this idea of multiple contexts that promote versus support topics should be in conjunction with the PE standards. Cassie, can you say more about that? Um, sure. I am a teaching and learning specialist in a large district in Minnesota, and um, I support both health and FIED. And um, we can get some um, ownership concerns between our health and fire teachers of who owns what and promoting sometimes feels like I'm teaching you those physical fitness aspects and supporting means I we will work towards goals, um, action steps, those kind of things. So just something to think about when we're looking at the fire standards and the health standards. Great, thank you. And Judy, I see your comment in here about creating additional materials to support professional development and rollout of the standards. Um, Nadine or Sarah, do one of you want to just hop on real quick and give kind of what that big high level vision might be? Well, actually, I'd like to defer. Is there anybody on the call right now that is on the subcommittee for the support group? Um, 
I think uh, Kalana is the lead if she is there. So we are we are we are developing resources or gathering resources for implementation. Um, it's an ongoing process right now. We are still taking suggestions uh, from the feedback maybe that we've gotten from convention and whatnot, but that is something that we think is an integral part of, we are revising the standards, but we want to just not leave everybody high and dry. We want to have resources for implementation as well. Um, but any of the task force members that are on, um, is there anyone on here? We do have a subcommittee for implementation resources. Um, just raise your hand or unmute your mic. It might be able to uh, give a little bit more specific direction. So we are we are developing that, and that will also be released. So our our manuscript, the glossary. Um, the resources, implementation resources, they'll all be released um, next March in tandem with the PE standards. So um, Nadine, do you have anything to add on to that? Or I'm, I'm not sure, I hope that answered your yeah. question Or okay. So yeah, I think that that is my committee. And um, I'd love to hear some suggestions in the chat because that is a very big question. We want to be very careful. Um, because this is for 50 states. And so the most important thing is that we are directing people to resources that um, will allow growth and further development of what is being taught in classrooms. So that's why we're hosting this town hall. It is very much our intention to um, provide resources. So that's what this feedback forum is for. What type of resources do you think would be um, something that your teachers would use, you would use? And so this is a great place to get that feedback. I also want to share that I think there is a question on that public survey that asks about resources. So um, if you have some ideas here and now, I think that would be, this would be a great place to share some of the things that you think would help the initial launch of the standards. But if you have ideas after this town hall, we also have a space in that public survey for you to, to add and share your ideas. Thanks. Angela. Oh, you're on mute. And, and, and just to, to another point of going not to go back, because we're always moving forward, to the idea of our intentionality in terms of trying to use, in terms of various, that use, that use of word various, it was to um, take into account and consideration um, that the, the discussion around diversity of whether it's SES in terms of differences, school districts or ethnicity, and diversity and because actually we can share in this group, um, even within the subcommittee, I mean, even with the task force, when we talked about um, giving using that as a word, we uh, we did actually see and talk about how in different areas of our country, you know, different words can mean different things. And we want everyone to understand the importance of diversity, but we also understand um, around DEI or all of the discussion and, and we want teachers to open up, as we're saying, this is for all children, to, to use that word, in a sense, when we were talking about it, to be able to extend beyond their own means as teachers, which can we know teachers also can um, be engaging in their own um, feelings and biases personally in terms of children or, se or SES. So that was really a part of that um, consideration. So if you... Um, in this group, uh, you know, have were um, have any thoughts around that? The the committee would also really appreciate that, because I do understand. We do understand um, with those comments of, of saying vague. You know, could you please clarify or, or expand more on what you mean by vague? That would that would help or share ideas of of how how we could support um, and 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 improve. And I, do, and I do just want to mention, sorry, Holly, I just want to mention as like a disclaimer, I know that the survey right now collecting feedback is long. <laughs> I want to acknowledge that, but it is a wonderful opportunity to get really specific in your feedback about what you think is missing and, and what that like language can actually look like. So um, 
we're definitely taking notes and we'll have this as a recording and we'll we'll collect this. But if you have thoughts of like specific language, the survey is still a really um a really wonderful place to help us collect that. Sorry, Holly. No worries. It's all good. Thanks, Audra. And I'm seeing from Mark and Becky Fulmer uh related to oops, I just have a um, terms like various, recognizing that there are a variety of different um, examples for dimensions of wellness, depending on where you are and which ones you are using. And so it might be uh, helpful to list some of those in the appendix. You know, asking the question, does variety give more specificity than various? Um, expanding dimensions of wellness at different student grade levels. Mary, I'm going to ask you, so expanding that, are you saying, um, to do more dimensions at lower grade levels? Well, in a sense, if we really want um, the purpose of using the term various, right, to to um, to get students to expand, you know, what, the, you know, across across the the health domain, I mean, it, it, by specifying it. So various is a little less random and we want them to focus on different domains and aspects of health so that you get the diversity in those responses and the the, the eclectiveness, I guess, um, as opposed to, like I said, with, with various, it seems as though um, I could name lots and lots of indicators of physical health or I, physical fitness, or I could name lots of various components um, mm -hmm within my socioeconomics or something like that, but it's not necessarily very diverse. And so if we kind of expand a little bit of the, going along with what some people said about context. Um, so if we add something about what those expectations are when we say various, whether it's across domains or across different, um, uh, different aspects of health. Great, thank you. And Mary Hansen, I'm seeing that you're talking about using the health triangle at middle school and the 10 dimensions in high school. Um, and in your previous comment about expanding it, would you suggest that the that we expand from the health triangle at the lower grades as well? I think it depends upon what the district has taught in the previous grades. Our students in Wilmer don't get much of a health education until seventh grade. And so they don't have a basic knowledge. So I think when starting out, if they just think that physical, mental, and social health belong together, and then we diversify maybe in seventh and eighth and on. Okay. Great, thank you. Amy. Hey everybody. Um, I will say, I just wanna add that it, I'm from New York State and um, the New York State standards, there's three and they're extremely vague and they've become useless. I'm just going to say it. Um, and teachers just don't, they're able to tie anything and everything to the standards, make, making them meaningless basically. So I do, I would say the more, if we can think about some way to be specific while also giving room, that would be amazing. But the main question I had was about uh, CASEL and the CASEL framework for SEL, because I know we've been able to say, hey, look how uh, much we have in common with SEL, the framework of self-management, decision-making. And I noticed we're no longer using self-management. And I also wondered like communication skills and relationship skills are very common and very, very similar, especially how they're written now. I just love how the work y'all have done and making uh, the communication skills very clear. And they're almost identical to the relationship skills in CASEL. So I was just wondering if there's any thoughts about maybe is it important to make the language of health ed even more similar to SEL? because we know SEL is so popular and so accepted, generally speaking. Thanks for that, Amy. And I welcome other task force members to chime on this as well. One of the conversation pieces that's been going on is around that term self-management, that it becomes really powerful in the world of SEL and um, also thinking about health is not just being about what I do for myself, but that bigger, all-encompassing ways in which health happens, right? And health outcomes happen. 
And so wanting to kind of expand that standard seven to make that more than a, just about that individual choice or individual behavior. And to your point, is there a way to capture and do both of those things that hasn't already been made explicit in this document? I'd just like to chime in too, you know, when we think about in terms of the entire country, you would be surprised that SEL politically in some states is uh, a negative. And, and so um, there may be opportunity for crosswalk and similar language, but we walk a really fine line, I think politically in, in uh, some states, even with this topic. Other thoughts here, as I'm, I'm seeing some comments in here. Um, appreciating the inclusion of health behavior change theories and models, perceived susceptibility, also seeing um, some notes about not just being about resources uh, to be appropriate, diverse speech to all kids. It's about educating and even re-educating health educators about what skills base looks like and feels like in the classroom, ensuring that our national and district toys are able to model it so that Shape America can really be a model for all of this. So while everyone is thinking, I, I just do want to, um, so we've, we have had some very, very rich discussions in this process. And so part of our discussion is just to kind of go along with the comments that you're receiving. It seems like a lot of the comments are geared towards being more specific. So we did think about that. And I think it's important that um, I just mentioned that these are standards. So this is a guidebook. It's not intended to be the, um, it's, it, it's very much intended to guide people on the path to create a common um, sense of what is being taught across the country. But we also do want to be sensitive that in the classroom, a teacher does have the ability based on what they see as the national standard to be creative, to be thoughtful, and also to take into consideration what their hyper local community is like. And so as we look at this, you know, um, yes, we're all from different places. And yes, you know, you're thinking about it where you are from. And that's fantastic. We appreciate all the feedback. Um, but also, let's think about the idea that we do want to leave some room for what is happening that trickles down to the state level and what is happening that is trickling down to the actual um, level of the district and how they are using these standards to guide their own creation. I want to, uh, sorry, can I just mention that Nadine, I think it was Nadine, has meant, has used a word that was really helpful in me kind of framing this conversation of where, what is broad purposefully, what is specific purposefully, and she talked about like the ecosystem of the, of the standards, and so that's something that I think we're still having those conversations as a task force, and we're really excited to get the the feedback from the community of like where is the appropriate place to provide this detail in the ecosystem of the standards. And I'm a visual person, so I needed to be able to like picture that in my mind um, when Nadine described it. So that's definitely something we're we're still we're still having conversations around. Thanks, Tilsa and Audra. And to that point of even appropriate, right? Who defines what is appropriate? Um, one thing that popped up in the chat here, what might be in the glossary that you all are creating? And so as a part of that, and Mary, Sarah, Candace, feel free to chime in here as well. The idea of the glossary really being some of those key terms um, to help folks be able to dissect what's in not only the standards, but some of the language that's being used in the national standards document per se, that's the kind of the compilation of everything. And to provide a space for people who may not understand, say, for example, what do we mean when we say functional information? Um, what is skills-based health education? So some of those key things. Um, any of my other folks, Mary, you wanna jump on in? Yes, I just had to unmute, thank you. Um, some of the feedback that we received at SHAPE, in particular from elementary teachers, um, and people that supervise elementary teachers is that 
they may not know what we're talking about when we use different words. And so more specificity was is needed for the elementary people. So that's a great place for words that are in the standards, in the rationale, in the performance indicators to be able to then explain what that word means in the glossary. So we hope to um, clarify any words that we're using that that we sort of think everyone knows what that word is and clarify it because what we are learning is that not everyone has a clear understanding of the language of skills-based health. So that's the point of the glossary. Thanks, Mary. Lori. Yeah, I wanted to also point out that um, standard seven is a hard standard. It always has been to wrap your head fully around and that, um, we didn't lose the concept of self-management. So I just want to point out, if you actually look at the second edition, you won't see the words self-management in either the name of the standard or in the brief description of the standard. That was something that was used when people made posters to align with the standards, but it wasn't in the actual standard. But the concept of self-management is a concept that you'll see in the indicators still in standard seven. So um, just one that one piece regarding that. And then I think if you if people can give feedback, and this goes back to the various things. So I'll give you one example. So with influence in the second edition, there were actually indicators that were like, talk about this influence and talk about this influence and talk about this influence. But the issue is that there's always new influences, right? And if we will date ourselves in some sense, if we like say here are the six influences and now there's eight. Um, so kind of social media is an influence that's changed a lot and evolved and there will be in laws or another influence. So um, if it's helpful to have kind of including but not limited to or such as and have a list because it's just really hard to conjure up what the various things are, let us know about that. And if you feel like um, it's not necessary in the indicators or in the rationale to include examples, then let us know about that also, because it's not going to necessarily be the same across the board. But sometimes, you know, even if you talk about dimensions of health, some there's the 10 dimensions of the health, there's the eight dimensions that you name the model, someone else has come up with a different number of dimensions. So there's not one be all model in terms of the actual number of things. Um, but let us know when it's helpful to give, including but not limited to, or examples, so that people don't have to imagine it, and when it's not necessary. But just know that our rationale was that things change, and that we don't want to date ourselves with the standards to have just a limited number of examples, and then things will come up that are outside those examples. And I think, you know, that there are some comments swirling here, too, about this idea of having the standards is one thing and then the support and resources that come after the development of the standards is another thing to get at the point of not prescribing curriculum, not being too prescriptive and at the same time not being too vague so as to leave people kind of out there floating and then you know schools or districts are able to then say that they're meeting the standards and aren't actually talking about health education related things but they're so big and broad so finding kind of that balance in between so absolutely, like into Lori's point, you know, the more uh, feedback and comment on that, the better. One other really specific thing that I want to mention was that when we say, and it's usually in the rationale, within individual interpersonal community and social context, that's very much a reflection of the diverse backgrounds and situations that people find themselves in. And that for one person, like, being healthy maybe here and for someone else it's like being here and you don't want to prescribe that everyone needs to be at the same point because for some kids they're homeless or they're dealing with all kinds of different issues and so um where you have to consider the context so that was to understand that language and what it meant for us that's that's um a little bit of context about the, those contexts and Lori, thank you for saying that. And for those of you that are uh, theory nerds like myself, that comes directly from the social ecological model. So um, some of you may have already recognized that, but um, that's a great point, Lori. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Lori. Also, I'm noticing in here the appreciation of the inclusion of health literacy and social determinants of health. 
and some other some other standards that are also out there. Yep. Though all you know, a lot of resources have been used in the development of these standards, both um, from within Shape America, outside of Shape America, in terms of health and health behavior theory and practice, looking at educational theory and practice. And so there's been a wide range of resources that have gone into uh, the revision of these standards. And so feel free to also keep sending along if there are resources or um, places of research that you want to share for folks in the task force to consider, please do. We're getting to be about that time, but I wanted to just kind of give one like quick moment if anybody else had a final question, final thought, or something that they wanted to add before I turned it back on over. All right. Oh, Suzanne, hi. Hi, Holly. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, I'm curious about the number of performance indicators. And I was able to give um, some feedback at the SHAPE conference itself and attended the, the sessions, really appreciated that. Um, when you look at other standards and indicators um, and compare them, the, the number seems pretty small to me um, for for health. And I'm just wondering how the committee came up with the number of uh, standards and indicators. Yeah, so I think, you know, kind of like a big answer to that is, is that the committee or the task force didn't go into each of the um, standards with a prescribed number. Really the way that the process worked is that small groups went in, looked at what was in the second edition and had conversations about what made sense in terms of developmental progression for young people across the pre-K to 12 spectrum and then built out or made changes from there. Um, in some instances, the performance indicator number expanded because what was currently there, it felt that things need to be broken down a little bit. In other instances, it may have shrunk a little bit because it just made more sense based on the direction of that revision. And so, you know, other folks chime in here, um, but I think in general, it was more about developmental progression and what made the most sense for or within those standards as performance indicators as it was like a specific number. I'm gonna just say one other thing, Toast. Oh, sorry, Mary. Lori, go ahead. Um, Mary can chime in. I'll just real quick. There's an intention that folks use the health education curriculum assessment tool, the HECAT, on standard one in terms of they really need specificity regarding what content and what grade levels. It's very detailed in terms of the HECAT in a way that has not is not done in the National Health Ed Standards. Uh, which emphasizes the skills more and cross-cutting content for standard one. So if states want more specificity to really crosswalk PCAT with the national standards to get that detail about content by grade level. Thanks, Lori. Mary. Yep. Um, in reference to the standards and the performance indicators, it, it was made very clear to the committee, don't change a lot. We've, we've got too much invested in, in what is already there. So um, it wasn't that we um, said we have to have so many. We examined each one and said, okay, are, is this still valid? Is this still what people need? And we did the same for each of the performance indicators. So um, we didn't start out with numbers. We just examined what was there um, and, and the charge was clear to us in the very beginning, don't change a lot of what is there. So that was part of the reasoning for what we did. Yeah, and to, to, and to change what made sense, right? Yeah, the change to what makes sense. A couple of notes in the comment section. Also, there's a question related specifically uh, mentions of sex education. So you'll notice that this document doesn't get specific into any specific topic area. And that's right, the intention was is to keep that kind of outside of the scope of the national standards, that there are other standards such as the national sex ed standards and other standards where individuals may go to find the content or topic areas to be then included with what is being taught um, in relationship to those skills and to pull out a standard one there as well. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna pause here.
thank you everyone for such a valuable conversation. Keep the comments coming. We would love to hear them. And who am I turning this back over to? Audra, I believe it's you. Back over to me, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This was really rich conversation. We're excited to be able to um, collect this kind of feedback in in the survey, in in conversations like this virtually, and also at convention. Um, it, it's going to be really helpful as we go through this next phase of work as a task force and get ready for um, which we will be doing a second round of public review and then releasing the standards at Cleveland next. Um, March 2024, which 2024 sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, but <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so, um, it, so to stay connected with the task force, where where we post our updates, where currently you can find um, the the both the draft standards for review as well as the survey link to complete the survey, which is open until May 2nd, so you still have time. Um, you can visit the. National Health Education Standards Task Force webpage on the Shape America webpage. So we hope you'll stay connected with us um, and we really appreciate you all being here. I do want to give a special thank you to our task force members that are on the call today. Everyone is so busy. It has been my privilege to work as their staff liaison. Um, coordinating across time zones and states that uh, states that um, observe daylight savings time in states that don't observe daylight savings time, but uh, they're they're a really great group. So I want to thank Sarah Toth and Nadine Marchesalt, our co-chairs, as well as task force members Holly, Angela G, Angela B, Candice, Lori, Lee, Mary, Nana, and Tilsa. Um, I just couldn't imagine doing this work with any other crew. So thank you again for being with us, and we appreciate your time. This recording will be available. Um, next week. So please share. And uh, again, we just appreciate you spending this time with us. So happy Monday and take care. Bye all.